Great. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ben A. Spaulding. I am the founder and artistic director of the Spire Chamber Ensemble and Baroque Orchestra. We're, we're so glad um, that you have uh, chosen to spend uh, 90 minutes with us uh, this evening. Uh, a few housekeeping things. We ask that um, you remain muted during the lecture, um, and then we'll have some time at the end to ask questions questions. Um, also feel free to use the chat feature to ask any questions or clarifications. We'd be happy to answer that as we go. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew Naylor, um, who is um, the uh, current uh, board president of the Spire Chamber Ensemble. Matthew also serves as the president and CEO of the nation's only museum dedicated fully to World War I, really a national treasure. Matt has spent um, many, many years uh, in the nonprofit sector leadership. He's been a great mentor to me. Um, I've learned so much from him and I know you're going to learn so much from him um, as well. So we welcome Matt um, as our special uh, guest this evening. There is um, a, in the chat, there is a link to the handout that you can uh, view as we, we go along. Um, and if there's any trouble with that, we can put it in again as we go, but you should see that towards the top of the uh, chat feature. Great, okay. Our goals this evening, uh, we have two. Um, as with all our lectures we've been doing from, the podi from this podium series, um, we want it to follow a bell curve. And so 10% um, is maybe uh, for people that you're, you're hearing some of these things for the first time. Hopefully 80% um, is a refresher and some new ideas on auxiliary skills that the conductors and singers can use. Um, and hopefully there's some advanced things um, at the other spectrum of the bell curve. Um, it is becoming more and more apparent that um, conductors and singers need to have other skills uh, beyond um, the music, these auxiliary skills um, to be really successful in the 21st century. So we're gonna spend our time talking about those. All right, let's dive right in. The first thing that we're going to talk about is something that I'm certainly very passionate about. Um, and I think everybody that um, leads an organization um, will agree with this is it's communication, 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 right? And if you didn't get the point, it's communication. Um, it's, it's so important. Um, the top auxiliary skill is to be really excellent at that, that we're checking our emails and our texts and our voicemails um, and responding um, as quickly as possible. If only to say that I will get back to you in more detail um, as you go. Um, I know this probably sounds uh, very uh, basic 101, but you would be surprised of how many people in our field um, that struggle with this. Um, Dr. Andrew Crane is Director of Choral Activities at Brigham Young University, um, and he recently said this. So his students ask him this question, Dr. Crane, what is the one thing that I can do to be successful in insert choral music related profession? He answered, respond to emails. And then they laugh and smile and think I'm joking. And so um, Dr. Crane certainly uh, understands this as well, uh, that to, to strive to be really good at that. Um, one tip that I've learned I wanted to share with the group is it's, it's certainly a lot of work to stay up on our emails, but there's, there are certain questions and certain uh, responses that happen a lot. And so you can create some form emails and Word and quickly paste those into your um, email body to save time. Of course, it's important to organize our communications in folders. Um, I like to create uh, separate folders for each organization I'm working with or each project I'm working with, really to keep things um, all in one place. And speaking of all in one place, I'm also surprised at um, sometimes our, in our profession how we don't love spreadsheets as much as we should. Um, and this is a really great way to keep um, lots of data in one place. And so we're not searching through emails um, and files. Um, I love Excel and Google Sheets to keep names of fellow teachers and feeder schools, recruiting opportunities, performance venues, instrumental contacts, the list goes on and on. And you can separate those by tabs. It's really great to keep all of that information um, in one place. 
The other, the other thing that I find very helpful is to make notes about who I've been in contact with, what the results were, and what some possible next steps are. As I say at the bottom of this page, strive to be the best communicator you can and your colleagues will love you. Let's talk a little bit about productivity. Another important auxiliary skill that we must have as singers and conductors. Um, it's really important to maintain a really um, accurate um, and detailed to-do list. Um, I like using a uh, Wunderlist or even Google Docs, something that can be synced between uh, various devices. I love this one. There's a lot of research um, in being able to keep a running list of everything that's on our mind, right? All of the things that we need to do, the tasks that we need to complete, the calls that we need to make, the emails we need to respond to, these creative ideas. If we write those down, the research suggests that we clear our mind. So we write them down so we can be able to be more free and more in the moment in the things we're doing. So I think that's some helpful advice there. Again, you would be surprised um, at, at sometimes how in our profession we don't keep um, the best calendars. Um, so it's important to be really great at that. Um, in my work with Aspire Chamber Ensemble um, over 10 years now, there has always been somebody every season um, that has uh, written down a, a, a gig wrong. Um, it happens all the time. And so that tells me that there's, I mean, we're all human and, and those mistakes happen, but it's happened enough that um, it's really important that we're, we're, we're just great at our calendars. One thing that we can do to, to, to be even more uh, proactive um, in our calendars is what I call the week ahead. So on Sunday evening or uh, first thing Monday morning, review the calendar of just the important things to come up and follow through with any um, invites or directions um, uh, early on so that doesn't happen right before the meeting. The other thing I learned from one of my dear colleagues um, is to schedule personal time on our calendar, um, and that is untouchable personal time. Um, what that does is visually it reminds us that, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this this afternoon, I'm going fishing, um, I'm in the Midwest right now, um, and so there's, there's a lot of fun things that we can do still out uh, when the weather's uh, a little nice, but it, plan those personal times because we want to be balanced people in our profession. A lot of research um, on productivity also states that we should do the most important thing first thing in the morning and for no longer than 90 minutes. We need to silence all our devices then. It's a really great idea to just put them away. And for that first block of time in the morning, for 90 minutes, do the most important thing. Um, great leaders um, and great CEOs, uh, politicians, religious leaders, this is all part of their practice. Um, so I, I, I offer that to you as a way to, to increase productivity. <clears throat> Um, constantly ask ourselves, is this the best use of my time? If not, what could be the best use of my time? And then fix it, right? We, we, we have a lot of control of what we do with our time. Um, and I think often we spend too much time kind of just going over and over what could be the best use of my time. Just say what it is and do it. The, the research suggests that as well. I love this one as, as we're learning to be more uh, productive is to monitor our moods. Why am I feeling this way? What can I do to feel better if I'm feeling a certain way? And uh, us singers and musicians and uh, conductors, we, we wear our hearts on our sleeve. And so it's easy to uh, get caught up in our, in our thoughts of, oh, this is gonna go wrong or this might happen. Um, but again, what uh, psychologists will tell us is that we need to have past data or past knowledge to justify a lot of the spinning around that goes on in our head. So think about that. I'd also like to suggest at the very end of the day, take a few minutes to identify and write down two or three things that you want to accomplish tomorrow. That is setting us up for success day after day. We all have to have promotional materials. Um, this is something that is important as well to create and maintain updated and accurate uh, headshots and CVs and resume and bios. It's typically one 
150 words or 200 words, recent recordings, both video and audio, sample writing materials, quotes and reviews, your website. A little bit of work from time to time goes a long way. I was just visiting with a colleague recently um, and he needed to update some of these materials. And I asked him, well, when was the last time you did that? And he said, four years ago. And I thought, boy, that's gonna be a lot of work to go through past programs and, and past things to get that information updated. A little bit of work, um, perhaps even uh, every week or every other week for 15 minutes will go a long way. Same thing with our repertoire list. And make sure that we're staying updated on that. It helps us identify gaps um, in our literature. Let's talk a little bit about, um, as we're gaining more leadership skills um, and communication skills, is network and professionalism. So it's super important to, when we can, be back together performing, uh, to introduce yourself to as many colleagues as possible. You'd also be surprised um, how easy it is to, to come into a new engagement um, and, and not necessarily uh, spend a few minutes um, introducing yourself. Be the person that, that starts that process. Um, be that person that um, says, hi, my name's Ben, where are you from? And engage with them. Remember, uh, our profession is people talking to people. We are communities. And so um, be the one that leads the charge there. I also think it's a great idea. Um, COVID has been very hard on so many fronts. But one thing that we can do is reach out to mentors and other colleagues and friends on Zoom um, and stay connected and to pick their brain and to keep learning. Um, so use this interim time when we cannot be together um, in person to grow your networking in, um, with this professionalism. Speaking of professionalism, um, it is so important to be immaculately prepared and do the job with joy. And I love this notion, and this has certainly been my experience. There's always gonna be somebody that um, has a more beautiful and expressive singing voice or a more um, artistic conducting pattern um, or has a way with words that just makes people want to follow you into the fire. Um, but more often than not, those people are sometimes underprepared and disorganized. So I charge all of us to be the kind of person that matches excellent technique with excellent preparation and we will see the great benefits of that. Again, it goes without saying, but with my work Inspire, this happens um, with colleagues that I love is um, punctuality. It's always important to be at least 10 minutes ready to go. Early is on time, on time is late, that age old adage. This is a soft skill, right? Um, but it really does pay huge dividends. Um, so just make that a part of our MO. The other thing I'd like to suggest is that we plan at least 15 minutes of, of all I've talked about in the last few minutes, I've actually it's been about 15 minutes, um, to devoted to admin time or uh, these developing these auxiliary skills um, every day. A little bit every day goes a really long way. So Matt, I wanted to see real quickly, do you have any thoughts? We've talked about communication and productivity. Is there anything that you've learned in your career that um, might be helpful to this per first part of the conversation? Well, I think that Ben, your comment about uh, being prepared and uh, before time uh, really makes a whole lot of sense. One of the few things that we can control is our own preparation. And the beauty of that is that it allows us to be able to respond to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. The, the big challenge is when we are sort of struggling a little with whatever the task is that we've got, the performance, the speech or whatever. And so there's some nervousness around that. And then the environment presents us with additional challenges. Being over-prepared allows us to be able to respond and take advantage of what the opportunities are. So I've certainly experienced that in uh, you know, my own um, uh, life as well. I used to work in the humanitarian sector. And so I would very often be in um, 
Central America or uh, Asia especially, and it would not be uncommon for me to be in a community and for uh, me to be called to the front of a community meeting and say, now uh, we look to Dr. Naylor to tell us about whatever, and they might expect a 45-minute presentation. So what I learned was to have already a, a fairly high degree of preparation in order then to be able to respond to the opportunities that came along uh, enabled me to be able to think and adapt on my feet. Uh, and so I, certainly what you're saying really resonates uh, to my own personal experience as well. Great. Okay. Let's talk um, a little bit about some leadership ideas that um, have certainly been helpful to me. Um, there's so much uh, about this. Uh, we are, remember the word conductor, I'm speaking to the conductors now, and we have lots of singers as well, but the word conductor comes from the Latin root conducare, which means to lead together. So our prime responsibility um, in this profession is to lead. Um, so I wanted to offer a, a few things that I think are helpful. Um, and this actually comes from a very personal experience. Uh, I call this five leadership and life lessons from a trash man. Um, my father um, was, has spent his entire career um, as uh, in this uh, sanitation department um, in Kansas City. He started um, at 18 on the back of uh, trash trucks and has uh, built a, a, a company um, that has, has grown leaps and bounds. Um, and so really from nothing uh, to being a CEO. And, and he, he taught um, myself and my brothers uh, several things. And I, and I think a lot of it applies um, to us as singers and conductors um, in leadership. One of the first things he said is always be a servant. We are the best when we serve others. He would often talk about um, the UCLA basketball coach, John Wooden. Um, you, you may have heard of him um, in the 70s and 80s, was just a national champion many, many times over. And John would always say, use your servant's towel every day or be a servant first. The motivational speaker, Rick Rigsby also says, our ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Moreover, pride is the burden of a foolish person. So if we start from this place of being servant leaders in our profession, that is from a place of honesty and a place that people will want to get behind us and will want to follow us. My father would also say, um, aim for the stars and if you hit the moon, that's just fine. It reminds me of something else. Um, called the uh, Pareto Principle or the 80-20 Rule. 80% 80 of the results come from 20% of the sources. Another way to think about that is spending time on high priority items in our life helps us keep focused on the stars, helps keep our gaze on the horizon of what we want to accomplish and how we want to lead. Um, so think of that 80-20 Principle. My father would also say, I don't care what you do in life as long as you do it with everything you have, with conviction and with passion. That is the mark of a, a life well lived. But it's not always going to be easy. The poet Robert Burns says, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. So part of this journey is to be flexible and adapt as needed. As we're, as we're living that life, um, that full of commitment, leave no stone unturned or, or discover every possibility, try every option, leave no stone unturned. The fifth principle that my father taught us um, is take it one day at a time. We can't get caught up in uh, one good day or one bad day. We are the results of our average of the average of our behaviors. Another concept here that is certainly helpful is we, we want to try to hit um, our minimum behavior most of the time and try to hit our preferred behavior almost all the time. What I mean by minimum behavior is, so if you're 
if you feel like you need um, 30 minutes every day to study scores um, or to really work through the passaggio on a certain thing is find out what your minimum uh, behavior is, the thing that you every day I have to do a little bit of this or I just don't function right. And then what your preferred behavior. My preferred be behavior might be 90 minutes on working on this specific uh, technical aspect. But try to live um, in the preferred behavior as much as possible. Aristotle put it this way as well. We are repeatedly what we do and therefore excellence must be a habit and not an act. I cannot recommend James Clear's book enough, Atomic Habits. He has several things that I think apply to us um, as musicians, as conductors, as singers. Start very small. Small changes over time add up. Three favorite quotes from his book. He would say, optimize for the starting line or position yourself for greatness. Also, perfect should not be the enemy of great. And his third most important quote for me was you can't optimize until you standardize. So setting standards in our lives, benchmarks that help us really keep towards our goals. The last principle I'd like to share with you um, in, from my father was always to be a lifelong learner. And you're, you're showing that now and being a part of this lecture is have an almost insatiable curiosity to always keep learning and staying green. The wonderful conductor Helmut Rilling says it this way, never lose the boyhood wonder. Never lose that wonder, that aha moment that first caused us to go into music. Carry that with you all the time. That might be the only thing that sustains you. I know I have thought about that many times over COVID. So always be a lifelong learner there. Part of that is Picasso says, good artists copy and great artists steal. So it's important that we're seeing other people's ideas and adapting them to our own. There's very few things in life that are brand new, uh, but learn from the great people um, in our profession and make sure that we are, if something works for us, to use it. I'd like to close in this section, the things that I've learned from my father. He also resonates with this uh, Rick Rigsby quote. It says, good enough isn't good enough if it can be better. And better isn't good enough if it can be best. So five things I learned from my father who started out as a trash man. A couple other things about leadership. Um, I really love this model. This comes um, from uh, a leadership uh, kind of guru uh, in the business world, um, Alan Freer. Um, and he talks about the four levels of maturity. So level four is the generous level, the ideal level for a leader. Am I deciding what to do next after a careful look at the landscape and evaluating the people around me? This is the level that us conductors, and I would say uh, singers on this call, um, there are will be times when you need to be a leader as well. Strive for the generous level. The next level is the cooperative level or the ideal level of somebody that is an individual contributor. They are um, somebody that's great to work with. Uh, so you can read more about that. And then there's this big black line in the handout. And Alan encourages us, you know, no matter what we do, we want to live above that line. We start getting below the line, some, some uh, bad things start to happen. We have the level two is the independent level. Um, I am taking care of myself and I don't really have um, regards for the work of others or the collegiality of others. And then we get to the bottom level, somewhere that we all dip down to, but if we strive to uh, not live in this level uh, very often, uh, it, it makes um, us really mature um, in how we respond to others. Um, are we only focused on ourselves? So getting out of the selfish level. I wanna talk a little bit about resiliency as well. This is something that there's been a lot of writing and a lot of talks during the COVID pandemic 
Um, but it's something that uh, we are going to have to face all of our lives. So a couple thoughts about being resilient. A life full of little changes and surprises is the definition of resilience. Look for those, embrace those. That is part of being resilient. When we are tested, we build resilience. When we are leaders, we have to build a culture, a trust culture that builds resilience. When we set that culture um, in our actions, the way we communicate, the way we interact with people, the way we apologize when we're wrong, that builds resilience. And always remember that any strength that we overuse too much becomes a weakness. The last thing I'd like to leave you with in this leadership section um, is uh, something that um, I, I learned, um, again, from uh, Helmut Rilling and the Oregon uh, Bach Festival um, and uh, the, the folks that helped organize that in the early 70s is to establish a mental health board for yourself. Surround yourself with people who are your cheerleaders in life. They don't need to be musical colleagues. Um, they should be from various walks of life. It could be religious. Um, it could be a family friend. But surround yourself with those people that you can have honest conversations with that will give you honest and open feedback. Um, we, are, we don't do this life alone. We are not um, we do not develop into leaders alone. So surround yourselves with those people. Great. Um, so Matt, I've talked a little bit about leadership. Is there um, anything else that comes to mind um, for you here? I think, Ben, uh, it's a, a great um, uh, a painting that you've begun to map out there for us. Certainly it all resonates uh, with my experience. Um, one of the things that I have found helpful is, a, is one of the principles that Stephen Covey has, um, this is the seventh principle, uh, begin with the end in mind, has been a great guiding principle for me. And it resonates with all that you're talking about there. This idea that we have a preferred future that we imagine and that we strive to create that preferred future whether that be you know, a, a performance, whether it be a, um, the way in which the organization is structured, you know, there's any ways of think about that. But for me, it's about um, imagining what our preferred future is and having a clarity and being able to, to speak about that, to articulate it, so that then you're able to then consequently um, build the resilience, uh, build the structure, be able to know when you're deviating from what your preferred future is um, and so on. It, it has for me been a really important guiding principle uh, for leadership to be able to articulate my preferred future um, and, um, and then align myself with that uh, as a leadership um, tool and as leaders. Uh, I, I think that that's a, a, a tremendously valuable principle. Um, that I think that is, is inherent in what you're saying. Uh, I would want to call that out. Great, thank you. I love that. Um, I will definitely remember that. I've, I've, Matt and I have had preferred future conversations over many years um, as the organization of Spire. So that's, that's wonderful. All right. Now we're going to take, we've talked about kind of some large uh, topics, things that we can apply in our lives. Um, I want to get to some really nitty gritty um, and kind of maybe potentially even a little nerdy um, topics on um, some administrative skills, some business skills um, that I have certainly learned over my professional work with Spire um, and learned from so many great colleagues on um, these auxiliary skills that we need to have. <clears throat> and one is on budgets, these realistic artistic budgets. Um, so I wanna suggest a few things um, that can be helpful um, because again, we're all probably going to have to work um, in some budget capacity in our career. It's becoming more and more so um, as the world changes. So for larger projects, we have to start early. Um, for conductors, that means the instrumental grids um, that 
um, we do mapping out uh, what, who plays and what movement, those have to be done almost first thing um, so we can build those budgets. I'd like to suggest that every single um, cost gets a line item. And so we're, and then you can subtotal um, into, but that way you don't forget things that it's really important that, um, that the harpsichord tuning and the harpsichord um, rental or the harpsichord cartage all of those get really spelled out. Um, so it's it's much detail as we can put um, in our budgets. I've also learned the hard way over many years is to try to find actual cost as much as possible. Um, and this is where I'm a little tenacious. Um, if I don't know an actual cost, I'm going to keep asking questions until I get as close as possible. Because um, again, I don't want to guesstimate too much on budgets. Um, now, there's some things that we, you know, we don't know, and um, we do our best. But as much as possible to get accurate data really helps us in our budgeting. A principle that lots of great organizations do is to create a contingency line item. Um, usually, that's at the bottom of a budget, um, and it's two to three percent of the total amount added. Um, because life happens, situations happen, and it, nothing goes 100% according to plan. You can also do contingencies um, in your subtotals. I marked there a little bit about concert master fees. Um, that's typically double the base fee. We have principal fees that sometimes 20 to 25%. Sometimes you'll have a soloist fee of 50%. You have what's called cartage, um, moving the timpani, the percussion, the harp double bass, all of those things. Sometimes we have um, to add to um, pension plans if we're using union orchestras and health benefits. Um, and that is a part of the equation as well. And that's really where we're gonna seek the help of a contractor. I'm gonna talk about contracting um, in a little bit, but I thought it would be uh, interesting for a moment. I am going to share two uh, fictitious um, budgets with you, but these fictitious budgets are are based on reality, are based on my um, experiences. Um, and you know what, Matt, I think I need to be host again so I can, I wonder if I can do that. No, I can't. Can you make me host again real quick, Matt? I got to figure out how to do that. If you go, uh, go click ahead. on my name and go to more. Okay. Okay. There you go. Great. Oh, now it should work. Now you are. Apologies for just a second. Okay. So I think we can all see this. So this is, there is no such thing. Um, I did Google it today as the Central Park Chorus. Um, but this is a, um, because actual, our actual budgets are sometimes have some uh, confidential information in it. But I wanted to give you um, a, a, two possibilities uh, for budgeting. Uh, a couple quick things here to note is that how many hours of uh, rehearsal and performance. You can see all of this listed. This is our size of orchestra. And these are the rates. Okay. And then down here, you have each instrument listed with then the first rehearsal rate, the dress rehearsal, the performance. You have the total of that. You have the pension, the health, the subtotal. Cartage is for a couple instruments and then the total. Um, and so this, um, you know, this, this is from 2015 um, union rates in New York City. Again, one of the most expensive places in the country. But in this scenario, you could do this Messiah with a schedule for um, just a little over $21,000. Um, that, that may sound, say, sound like a lot, um, that certainly is a, a, for a New York City rate, you could probably do this type of messiah at other places in the country um, for quite a bit less. The important thing I want to note here is um, where it says we always have, this is why it's so important that us conductors are really carefully thinking through the score. Because one way we can save money, look right here on uh, our first rehearsal, I am not using the oboe, the trumpet, or the timpani. They don't play as much. And so I, that is a way that I can save cost with not having them for that rehearsal. And then the next one, I have a 2D rehearsal that um, can, uh, that has everybody. 
And so this is a template that you can use um, and that you can see how these figures um, were gathered. Uh, it's very clearly spells out um, who's principal players and, and various things like that. And the other one, again, um, a made up group, um, the Midwest Repertory Singers and Orchestra. Um, and this is a Bach B minor mass, um, certainly based on my experience. Um, this is a project um, based group um, where, where artists are flying in and driving in. And so what's important in this budget is that every single thing is spelled out. So I have the venue rentals. So Ben was... We're still seeing the Central Park. Oh, you know what? Thank you. Let me, let me, I appreciate that, Matt. Let's see if I can do it again. Is that better? Are you seeing? Good. Okay. I'll start over again. Um, Midwest Repertory Singers Orchestra, the Bach B and Minor Mass. And so I've always included notes. Again, I don't want to be surprised. I don't want to be surprised by this $100 security card fee. So that's incorporated in the total. Um, so you can see everything that's listed. I say what the rate is. I say um, what the choir count is, what the string count is, um, doubling rates, all of that. I, I list all the travel expenses line by line again. So there's no surprises on who needs a flight, who's driving and et cetera, et cetera. These are rental car costs that I would have greatly researched. Um, and so I know um, some possibilities there. The last category is all the other stuff that goes into this project um, and cartage, uh, organ rental, um, archival recordings, everything that you're going to write a check for um, needs to be in this budget. And then we have that contingency of 2%. So those are two, uh, if budgeting is brand new uh, for you, or if um, you've done some and you're looking at more complicated budgets, uh, when you get into pensions and all those other things with union orchestras, um, that is definitely some helpful information to have. So when we're contracting, um, I'd like to recommend that we find the best contractors in our region uh, first. Those are the people that um, are respected by the players. Um, they typically receive uh, 15 to 20% of the gross fees. You, you saw that in both budgets. I would also recommend though, that if you're contracting just a, a rather small ensemble, maybe for a community choir or a church or another organization, um, you can save money by doing it yourself. It's a, a way to get to know players and build relationships. And I, I talk a little bit about um, in this section on page five of how to do that um, and some possibilities there. Um, so we'll, we'll move on. I, I gave us also a sample. Um, so if you are going to do some of the contracting or encourage your contractor to follow these principles, here's a fictitious um, sample contracting email or a offer email. The three things that it must include is the fee, the schedule and the repertoire, because if it doesn't include those things, they're going to ask. So that's really important. So you can see um, that I introduce myself. I say who recommended them. I, if I have heard them play before, I try to make some kind of personal touch to say that I heard you play at this past thing and it was uh, wonderful. I'd like to inquire about your availability for such and such gig. I lay out the details very clearly, what the music is, what the dress is, what the pay rate is, what kind of tax form they're going to have to fill out, um, the address of uh, the engagement, where to get into the building. All of those things help dispel confusion. Um, and that's what we want as upfront as possible. Bottom of page six, I talk about some uh, various uh, compensation rates. Um, you, can, you can read those. Um, at the bottom of page six, I, uh, so we're in Kansas City. This is uh, some samples of, um, actually, this is the not the most current uh, Kansas City Union scale. There was another one in 2019. Um, there's some rates for New York City. I guess some regional rates. Um, I guess some rates for professional choral singing, professional early music um, in our country, and some solo vocal work. 
Um, so those are all things that I hope are resources for you that um, when we get back to being able to be in person that you can share with contractors or you can use yourself. Wonderful. Well, we're going to um, turn our attention now, uh, and Dr. Naylor is uh, going to talk us through several other auxiliary skills um, that are really important to being leaders um, in the choral um, and singer profession. So, um, Matt, can you first let's start? Um, can you share with us some of uh, your fundraising and developmental best practices and principles? How do we raise money? And you're still muted. Yeah, good deal. You think by now with all this Zooming, I would have figured it out by Zoom or Teams all day long. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity, Ben. And um, it's great to be with a group of people who have shared goals uh, to organize ourselves around important missions. And uh, all the things that you've been talking about certainly resonate uh, with, um, with me. And uh, it's a pleasure for me then to talk a little about then uh, some of these other elements, which perhaps grease the wheels to enable us to do what needs to be done. So um, fundraising, you know, um, I think that there's an extraordinary tradition in the United States um, whereby uh, people who, um, people by and large seek to be charitable in order to be involved in missions that matter. There are many, many missions that matter. And uh, for those who are uh, part of the meeting today, um, you will have people who believe that your mission matters or your cause or your um, uh, choir or orchestra or whatever, but let's call it a mission, um, who already are connected to you or will be connected to you when they get to learn more about you. And it is a, there's a, a, it is a particularly unique tradition in the United States. Now, in other countries, and I'm, I was born in Australia, um, I've traveled extensively around the world. Um, it, it, is, it is not the case in other countries. Uh, it is really a uniquely North American tradition, United States tradition, um, but certainly it's growing in other places. And I, I think that it's a um, something which is helps people build a greater sense of meaning in their lives, which is, um, I, I think, a great beginning place for us to think about fundraising. So I like to think of ourselves when we're doing fundraising as being midwives of meaning. So what I mean to say about that is that we all yearn for the meaning in our lives. We all yearn for a purpose in our lives. And what you do when you invite somebody to be philanthropically involved in your mission is that you help them satisfy a sense of meaning in their own lives. And so the consequence then of you engaging people philanthropically is that it, 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 you are you're giving them an opportunity to respond to something which is deep within them, a desire to be involved in something that matters. Now, it might be hyperbole for some of you. It might be, you know, sounds sort of extreme. And certainly there are some folks who are, look, just shut up, take my 20 bucks and don't come back. And certainly, hey, we'll take their money. But but what our goal is, and if we think about it through this paradigm of, of fundraising and philanthropy helps people find meaning in their lives, it makes it a hell of a lot easier than the sense, the alternate, which is you're sort of rattling the can to get people's change. It irritates me sometimes when I have uh, people that I work with and perhaps board members who will tell me, oh, Matt, I went and spoke to such and such a person. I told them I need them to give me X number of dollars and I'll never come back and ask them again. And I think, oh my gosh, no, we do want to go back and ask them again because ideally it's a, they are being involved in something that's important in their life and it's something which blesses them and allows them to express something meaningful 
And we want them to then give again and again for our benefit, but for their benefit. See, so, so the, the perspective that I take, uh, Ben, and, and uh, the audience is to think about how we firstly frame this. How do we frame fundraising? And, and, and there is a philosophical argument that says by inviting people to give, you are helping them find meaning in their life. You are, in fact, giving them a service and making and helping them make their life richer. So if we think about it like that, then we'll want to do it all the time. We'll want to do fundraising a lot. So having said that, then let me give you some ideas around that. So um, many of you will have a board. So first and foremost, you want to begin with your board. And we're going to talk a little about board, I think, in a, in a few minutes' time, Ben. But we certainly want the board to exhibit their financial support. And ideally, you want to have all of your board members somehow philanthropically involved. Not everybody can give to the same level. Many of us involved in many charitable uh, endeavors. So, um, so, you know, we've got to parcel out. Those people who often serve on boards are on many boards, perhaps, or several boards. But you want to have their philanthropically involved. And you want to then, the, the beauty of that is that you then want to have them involved in stewarding other donors. So, for example, uh, in the board, and I've worked for boards for decades. Uh, I work, I've worked for boards. And um, there's, there's wonderful two opportunities for you to involve the boards by having them philanthropically involved. The first is to have them involved in thank you calls and letters. So when donors make gifts, have a board member call and thank the donor. I've, I've been in places in other cities where peer organizations who have, persons who work, have, have said to me, Matt, I got a call from one of your board members or, or sometimes a volunteer, and they called not to ask for a gift, but to thank me for their gift. I, I, they, they said, that was the most extraordinary call I've had. It was really, really meaningful. So having board members or volunteers, and remember board members are volunteers, but there might be some other volunteers that you work with, have them be involved in calls or writing notes of thanks. Thanks for your, the gift. And I, I write notes every day to um, people who make gifts to the museum and memorial. Um, I, I, I send, um, I, I have a little station where I write handwritten notes uh, for folks who make gifts. And then secondly, involve them in follow-up with cultivation events. Having board members, having volunteers involved in cultivation events says a lot also to prospective donors. So the first thing, involve your board. The second thing, creative plan. So you want to look at what you're already doing in order to be able to plan for what you want to do next. So four basic steps there. Firstly, create a baseline. Look at what you've done in the past. What have you been doing to raise funds? Um, I'm presuming here, everybody here is involved in uh, somehow getting philanthropic support, even though it might be small. But look at that. Look at the grants you might have received, the events, the mailings. How many have you done? What sort of asks have you been involved in doing? So firstly, what have you been doing? And then, and then ask yourself, okay, what, are, what were the results of that? Can, can you... Um, can you analyze that and identify what was working, what, what seemed to be doing uh, well? And then secondly, create some goals from that. Ask yourself, how much money do you want to raise in this next period? What are the resources that you need? And, and what's the gap between what you're currently raising and what you need to be raising? So having that sort of information laid out, then certainly determining what you need to change. So do we need to keep doing the same things or do we need to be changing what we're doing? And then um, what, what, what is it that you might do? What new cultivation events might you uh, have? What individuals can you solic uh, solicit? How can your board members leverage their relationships to help you with some fundraising? What sort of training do you need to give to board members and so on? And then lastly, write down what your plan is. So, um, you know, what, what are the necessary steps to, to get there? What's the timeline? What's the, um, what's the budget that you need? And we're, we're not talking here that you're going to have a big development team. It might be simply that you're going to say, I'm going to have coffee twice a month 
with one of the with somebody who already is a donor or I'm going to have coffee once a month with a donor and I'm going to ask them if they would bring along somebody who we might be able to talk to. And, uh, you know, simple things like that, creating a plan. I'm going to write uh, a letter twice a year, you know, having the plan laid out in order for you to know what the heck you want to do. Um, so, so, so the first thing is, you need to know what you want to do with your with your fundraising to have a plan. The second thing is that the bulk of philanthropic giving comes from what we generally call major gifts, which is people who give, and it depends upon what your organization, it might be more than $1,000. In some organizations, it might be more than $5,000, depending upon how you categorize what a major gift is. But what we know is that there are a group of donors who give most of the money and we know of the whole philanthropic pie that's given in the United States, about 85% comes from individuals. So just regular folks next door give about 85% of the more than, I think it's about $420 billion that was given last year in the United States. About 6% corporate, about 7% from um, foundations, and then estate giving is a, is a portion as well. Um, so individuals is a really important area to focus on and a persons who can make major gifts. Why? Because if you're able to spend time with people who can make larger gifts, you're going to, you're putting your energy in the right places. Um, and so how, how can we do that? Inviting some folks to a performance inviting them to a practice and giving them behind the scenes tour. If somebody perhaps who's a thousand dollar donor, you might invite to come and talk to some of the orchestra or come to see the back of the performing arts center. If you've got the ability to do that or whatever it might be. The idea is they get some sort of exclusive look and then that cultivates a relationship with them. They're leaving saying, wow, that was so cool to be able to do that. Thanks, Ben. What a, what a great experience that was. Have coffee with them. Update them on what's happening. Pick up the phone. Call your donors. Keep in regular touch with them, especially important during the time where we're not able to do performances. So one of the conversations that uh, Ben and I have been having is how do we retain relationships with our audiences how do we re retain relationships with our donors when we can't have them along to performances? And so there was a whole series of like meet the, um, the singers, meet the uh, orchestra, where there would be a behind the scenes type of conversation, um, really important for us. And we, we've done a whole series, Ben has done a whole series of these in order to create touch points with donors and also touch points with the audiences, but especially with donors, writing notes, sharing, um, you know, information. Uh, I, I will have share information with major donors in a newsletter or an email or a phone call or a lunch. At the moment, we're not doing lunches. We do Zoom calls, uh, phone calls, updating them, insider sort of information. Uh, people want to feel like they're belonging. Cultivating those relationships with major donors is really important. And then providing where it's appropriate, meaningful volunteer opportunities for people to become more involved in your organization. Um, that might be a, on the board. Uh, it could be in an advisory capacity. Um, it could be even if they're willing to be a host at a performance um, sometimes or, a, or hosting other uh, donors can be a wonderful way of uh, cultivating those relationships. So I, I want to encourage as part of your overall fundraising or philanthropy, Ben, is that we invest our time in cultivating relationships with persons who have um, already exhibited a um, desire to be major donors, however you categorize that, um, and then um, is continuing to stimulate that giving and asking them for more. Last year, they gave $1,000. Would you be willing to make a gift this year of $1,300? Um, 
uh, which would enable us to do an X, Y, and Z, uh, th those, those sorts of things. Remembering that the, you are doing this to help them also bring satisfaction to their own lives. What does money bring us, if anything, but satisfaction and joy? And there is a period in people's lives where they're moving from um, leisure to legacy, from leisure to legacy. And when we're able to identify people who are making that transition, it's sort of the perfect storm because they're wanting to really invest in the things that matters so much. So Ben, I wanted to um, make some comments about grant writing. Yeah. Um, do you want to pause? Or are you happy for me to move to that? I think just real quick, um, you might, could you for just maybe two or three ideas for, for those on this call that are brand new with organizations or maybe they haven't even started something yet or maybe it's just it started and it got shut by COVID what if we don't have a lot of donors already what are where can we start with what are some ideas on just how to how to start that sphere of influence sure I think that uh, firstly gathering people around you who believe in the mission is really important and in many respects, they become your board, whether it's a formal organized board in a 501c3 uh, you know, type of organization, or it's a group of advisors. I've got this dream of establishing this series or this event or whatever. I need a group of advisors to help me think about that. People who believe in you. And then you ask them, who can you help introduce us to who also might share this dream? I, I, I spend quite a lot of time um, working with folks who are, um, who are donors and or prospective board members. And the question that I ask them is, is this something you'd like to be involved in? And then secondly, who should I be talking to? And they might say, look, I'm not really, this is not for me, but I know who it is. People love to give advice. And sort of a pain in the bum sometimes, isn't it? But the reality is that people love to give advice. And so gathering around you people who can help introduce you to people who you think you ought to talk to. And then you ask them the same question. Is this something that, that you could, you'd like to get involved in? And how can I help? They'll say, well, and they have a few things up your sleeve. One of the things that we need is philanthropic support. Would you be willing to help us you know, meet our budget needs. Oh, no, I'm not really willing to do that. I've just learned about you guys. Well, what about if you were to come to our first performance? Would, would you be willing to do that? And then who do you know who I need to talk to? I know this person at church, they're really, that this is really up their alley. And so asking this, would you help and who do I need to talk to? Every, every meeting that you have, who do I need to talk to? Just two people. So you just want two people and then have them introduce you to those people. So it's not a cold call. You, you don't want to call them and say, Ben said I should talk to you. You need Ben to call them and say, I need you to talk to Matt. He, he told me about this project. I think you'd really like that. And so that sort of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, introduction and networking is tremendously powerful for us. That's great. Thank you. So you said you had some thoughts on grants? Indeed. So, um, you know, there are people who, uh, who give away money. That's their profession. <laughs> and um, uh, that's a, a wonderful group of people to get to know. And so we ought to um, associate ourselves with those organizations. And I know for Spire, it's a uh, it's very important source of revenue. And um, also for my work at the Museum and Memorial, it similarly is a very important source of revenue. So, um, yeah, so I just got a four basic steps uh, for you. The first is that many foundations are willing to take a phone call before any sort of form, uh, formal application for you to have a bit of a chat with a program officer to see if this is something where there might be opportunity for a good match. And so the initial task of calling the foundation to ask their advice, to talk about what you're thinking about, seeing if there might be an opportunity for a match, that's a good first step. Again, they may say, yeah, look, that's the sort of thing. 
or look, that's not, not in our area of focus, you might then be able to ask them, you, in your association of other foundations, would you be willing to share with me who you think I should call who are supporting this sort of work? So program officers, their job is to help the organization be successful and you can help them be successful by calling and chatting with them. And then, uh, and then many a time, they will shepherd you through a process. Um, remembering that by them doing that, they be successful in their job, but you're also successful because you get a grant. The second thing then often is a application or a letter of inquiry. So sometimes there's very formal processes online. There's a application you have to fill out. You got to attach documents to it. It's got to be done by a certain date and so forth. Other groups, there's more wiggly squiggly stuff. And so they might instead want a, a letter of inquiry. Generally, if it's an application though, you need to do it exactly as it's required. If you don't, and if you don't attach the stuff, sometimes um, it puts you on the bottom of the list. So it's really important to be really clear about what's required. Talk to the program officer. Remember, they're your friend. Um, and, and then follow what those, um, those rules are um, and, and uh, you know, make the application. And then build a relationship with the program officer. So thirdly, after you've made your initial conversation, you've decided to apply, then maybe you've mailed your application or you've submitted it online or you submitted your letter of inquiry. Um, it's, it's okay then to chat with them. Did you get it? How? Maybe even it's okay in some instances, like we do at my place, we might send it in draft form and ask for their feedback. So send it in, would you be willing to just help me? Uh, I, I, we, we really would welcome your critique of this and then, and then you know, finalize it with their input. If they're invested in your application, it really helps the success of it. So very often they're scoring the applications by certain criteria, understanding what those criteria are and addressing them in the application. If you have opportunity to do that, it's a good idea. And then once you have received the grant and it might be a $3,000 grant from a local city uh, arts project or a, or a much larger grant from a foundation or something, whatever it be, um, you want to make sure that you send them a thank you letter, call them up, call the program officer, continue to build the relationship, invite them to some of the programs, whether they come or not, it doesn't matter. We'd like for you to be, you know, our guest, would you be willing to come? They might not want you to call them out in the audience, but, but that they have the opportunity to come along, send them a newsletter if you have any sort of communications like that. If you've got some photographs from the event, you might like to take those and send them. They love being updated on what on what's happening. If you've got any, um, uh, you know, client events or events for donors, inviting them along as well because they're a foundation. Sometimes you might think of them differently, but they also need to be cultivated like you would a major donor. Uh, and then make sure that you send all of the reports and you send them on time. Some are very, you know, explicit about what they need and you need to make sure that you satisfy all of those things. Um, if you don't get the, uh, the grant, sometimes it's been the experience with Spire. It's been my experience in organizations. You don't get it the first time. It might require several years of proving yourself before finally they're willing to do it, but keep doing those steps anyway. Keep in touch with them. Keep asking them. If you've been deficient in areas, work on that areas. You know, if they have a scoring, for example, and you're deficient in certain areas, and generally they'll share with you what those deficiencies are. Work on those, update them about that. We're working on this. Here's the progress we've made. Keep, keep them informed about that um, and just keep the relationship going so that the next time when you apply, um, you know, you're able to then have greater odds in um, receiving that. I mean, these folks, their job is to give away funds. Sometimes the statutory responsibility to give it away. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, so it's a, uh, you can help them be successful in their work and, uh, and it can be a great uh, opportunity to build a, 
an important funding relationship. So I think that those four things are, are pretty basic for us. Um, calling the foundation uh, before you apply, um, sending an application, making sure you follow the rules, building a relationship with the program officer, and then um, you receive the grant, don't stop calling, continue to build a relationship with them, update them with photographs, invite them to the performances or, or whatever the, the funding might be um, so that they're able to see the benefit of, of, uh, of their investment. So some thoughts there generally about fundraising and, and so on. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. I just one quick clarification. I noticed you started with spending our time with people first, and then you went yeah. into grants and foundations. And it's it's yeah. easy to reverse right. that. It, there's right. you know just that right. we that we put our priorities um, where, like you just said, and you know part of that it is sometimes we're uncomfortable about asking people for money, and it's easier to do it sometimes when it's a form. But if you are able to tweak how you think about this, then it's a very meaningful opportunity to, to be inviting people to be involved philanthropically. Uh, and people will thank you for it. Thank you for the opportunity. And often people might do things like this to honor a loved one, you know, to honor their, um, you know, their, their husband, their parents, um, you know, their children as a graduation, a special graduation opportunity. Um, there's, so, so you're, you're really, I think, if you frame it like that, it's easier to be people focused than it is to be form focused, which is perhaps if we're a little bit uncomfortable about the idea of money, uh, we might be more form focused. Definitely. Yeah, <clears throat> that's so helpful. So when we've 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 talked about um, these these leadership skills and, and and budgeting, and now we've raised some money. What, can you give us a couple thoughts on how do we how do we market? What um, you know, you spend a lot of time um, in various positions of your career getting um, people to come to things and, and to be involved. Can you share with us a few sure. thoughts there? Yeah. So let's all just confess for a moment that we're in a massively competitive environment. You know. If it's, if it's not the other choirs or symphonies or choral groups or chamber orchestras, it's the museums or it's the, um, you know, the other attractions that are around town or it's restaurants or it's family time or it's, you know, Nintendo or, you know, the, the, the opportunities that people have to do whatever, it's, it's massively competitive. So we need to see ourselves, it seems to me, uh, competing with those things. So, um, you know, that's what I think about a lot at the, uh, in the museum business, um, that we are competing with people going to, uh, you know, the aquatic, going to the shops across the street or the Lego land or the aquatic center or, or time with their families, all these things we're competing with all the time. So therefore, um, so how do I think about that? So when I think about then, how do we invite people to what we do, whether it be working with Spire or other things that I'm involved in? The first thing is for me is to have a clear and compelling mission or purpose. So what's our mission? What's our purpose? And then what's the differentiator? So why, why come see us? What is it about us? that warrants the investment of your time? How will you, what, what, will, what will happen to you by experiencing us? Having a sense and understanding an articulated understanding of that is for me really important. Having a clear and compelling mission or purpose statement, and then having a clear brand identity or messaging around that. So what do we say about that? Um, what's our brand identity? Um, you know, some uh, nonprofit, uh, when, I, when I was in the humanitarian sector, we used to talk a lot about this. How, well, how are we different than other like entities that are all asking for your money? So why give to us 
when Children International or World Vision or whatever are also asking for your money. And so we worked a lot on this. What's the differentiator? What's our compelling mission? And, um, and the brand identity. And sometimes um, some of the academics from the university and the nonprofit management would come and say, Naylor uh, is, uh, is corrupting you with this idea of brand identity. Uh, but I, I totally believe it. So for Spire, the, one of the questions that Ben and I've worked with is what, what is, makes us different? So, so for years, we've done the Messiah. We've done it in the same week as the Kansas City Symphony and Chorus. So there's what? How many orchestra, Ben, in the symphony? Oh, 150? Uh, in the orchestra, probably 80, and then 150 in the choir. Okay. So 150 in the choir. So it, I mean, the view is spectacular. And then you got 80, and then you got the, the Jan on the organ, or the, harp, the organ, and then someone's on the harpsichord. So, I mean, it's, it's massive. And, and then within that same week, we got 20 singers and, what, 18 in the, in the orchestra doing the Messiah. So why, why would you come see us when you can get, you know, like this massive experience seven days before? So Ben and I would talk a lot about this. What's the mission of our work and what's the differentiator? Why come to us? And so sort of foundational in this conversation is, to, is this question of your brand identity and why? And then, then that gets lived out then in all of your communications. So I've waffled enough to say that. It's a really important conversation for everybody here. Why us? And then, you know, what do you got to do? Build relationships with current supporters. That means your database has to be clean and your messaging has to be consistent. You need to invest in online marketing. The beauty of that is you're able to measure uh, how many people are clicking on your, if it's paid ads, uh, if you've got a Google grant, which um, some will, if you don't, go to Google inquire about it. Uh, there's, um, there are grants available. Social media content, educationally focused, perhaps a, a, a once a, every two months e-newsletter, an email that just gets sent. It doesn't have to be fancy, but you use MailChimp or something to send it out, keep people informed. Streaming content, like we talked about earlier, little five minute, three minute little vignettes and so forth. Consider promoting posts on social media, Twitter and Facebook and so forth. And then get your supporters to promote you. Um, peer marketing is invaluable. People who share your content, people will listen to that and, and pay attention to it more than if it's just you. So it all begins with who we are and what our differentiator is. And then what's our core messaging and then consistency about that. So I think that, Ben, there's some building blocks that I have always found to be really important. Yeah, that's wonderful. So our, our last topic we wanted to visit with you about is, so we've, we've done all this work and we, we don't do this in a vacuum, right? What you said from the beginning, we need other people to join us on this journey. So can you give us some thoughts on about our, our, our board and recruiting and, and um Helping, helping bring other people that share and catch that vision along with us. You bet. Um, so let me just comment that um, we, uh, we uh, most of us, not, not all of us, but most of us exist in the nonprofit space. There are, there are sometimes for-profit entities, but I think most of everybody on this call would be in the nonprofit space. So nonprofit as a way of organizing is not a business strategy. So we should seek to have sound financials and to make money because making money allows you to invest in future years. And there's a misnomer that suggests that nonprofits shouldn't make money. The deal is nonprofits shouldn't distribute those amongst their shareholders. So they don't give it to their board members. They invest it back into mission. So a nonprofit, remember this, it's a way of organizing. It's not a business strategy. We do seek to make profit, but it's more than profit. So a board is really helpful with that and to help us be able to organize the best organization to carry out the mission. The purpose of the board then is to, uh, is to establish public trust. In other words, they're saying we are ensuring that your gifts 
uh, that you're getting some tax deductibility for are being used in the manner in which is legally permissible and that you intend. There's a public trust function. Boards help us with strategy, help us think about um, what's important, how do we get there, where do we want to go, and what are the steps we need to take. It's, it's a, um, a, a group of advisors who help us think about that and, and help hold us accountable, help open doors for us around strategy and opportunity. Um, they uh, provide guidance and direction and support for the executive person, whomever that might be, whether it's a volunteer or a paid person, advocate for the organization, fourthly. That is to say, they promote us, they, um, they seek to clear the way and then help us ensure there's appropriate financial resources. So using their Rolodex to help us introduce to people advocating for people, joining us for coffees when we're talking to donors and so forth. So understanding what the board's role is, is important. And then you say, okay, now who do we need around the table? If we, if we are here and we want to get to there, what are the types of people that we want? So in my, in my organization now, um, we're a national uh, organization, but our board is mainly regional. And we've said in order for us to really be um, philanthropically national, we've got to have a more national board. So we've said in the next three years, we want five board members from well outside of the region. So we have a strategy around building the board and who those members might be. And, um, and, and that's to help us get from here to there. So we're clear about where we wanna get and then we build the board accordingly. So it might be just a startup. So how do we get some, um, uh, you know, build the organization might be, you know, how in two years time, what do we want to be like? Who do we want to be in two years? And then who do we need in the board to help us get there? What type of board do we need? Um, so you make a list of ideal board members. You might establish a couple of committees. Don't have to have fully fledged four or five, six, seven committees. Maybe there's one or two or task forces dealing with questions that you have. And then um, developing a job description for a board member. Here's what we need you to do. And then inviting people to be a part of that board. So it's simple. Who are your ideal board members? Uh, let's uh, recruit some of those persons, help them understand what it is we're asking them to do, and then give them an orientation. And then retaining those board members is equally critical. So making the work interesting and meaningful for them, not just rubber stamping things, but playing to their strengths. So that's, um, you know, I've learned over, over the years that if, you, if you're able to build a really great board, they bring way more to the table if you're able to play to their individual strengths. So playing to their strengths, make board meetings interesting um, and then expressing gratitude for their work, thanking them for what they do and for what they give and for the introductions that they make, being a good steward of their Rolodex when they're willing to introduce you, make sure that you're on time, that you're prepared, that they leave the meeting saying, then their friend tells the board member, that guy's or that gal's, they're really good. They, thanks for the opportunity to meet them. Uh, so that then they do it again and they'll do it again and they'll do it again. So a board can be a fabulous asset to you to multiply the um, impact of your work um, by, by those things. Um, having a, a sense of what it is that you need for them to be doing, attracting the right type of candidates and then helping them be successful as board members. So some thoughts. That's great. Thank you so much. Well, we have thrown a lot at folks uh, tonight. There's, uh, I, I talk about these lectures are just like we would do a rehearsal. It's, it's fast paced and uh, a lot happens in a short amount of time. So we wanted to take uh, a few moments um, at the end here to see if uh, we can answer any questions um, that the group uh, may have or clarifications. Um, we'd be happy to spend the next few minutes doing that. You can feel free to put it in the chat, or um, if you want to um, unmute and ask it, we will do our best to um, give some advice.
Well, Matt, I have one to maybe kind of get us going. Um, talk a little bit about COVID fundraising and just how do we, in this interim time, uh, what are your thoughts on, on um, not only surviving, but trying to thrive through this? Um, the, it seems to me uh, keeping a relationship going with donors and with our audiences to the degree that we're able to do that, we need to do that. Um, in, in whatever way, and we're, our circumstances all are, are different, but being creative to keep in touch with and still be able to um, maintain a relationship with audiences and with donors is really important. Uh, sending notes, making phone calls, um, having Zoom meetings, um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be fundraising. Um, if, if you're not fundraising, somebody else is, and somebody else is talking to your donors. Um, so um, it might be that you need to have a couple of Zoom meetings before the person's comfortable for you to ask them for a gift. Um, but he checking in to see how they're going. The beauty of this is that we're experiencing so much of this together is that you can call and just have a person share about what's their experience. And so um, maintaining relationship with some of the key important players who are connected to us is so important. That might be with singers. It might be with musicians as well, keeping those relationships going. The good news is there is light at the end of the tunnel it's scary though, because we don't know um, how that's going to impact life post COVID. Um, so the next 12 months are challenging in this, in the arts sector. Uh, the, the deal is I think to keep the relationship with people and experiment, you can do things smaller, uh, experiment, look around, copy what some others are doing, uh, you know, uh, try it out. We, we at the museum have you know, had to massively change what we do and um, sought to be very creative. We've learned a whole lot from that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, also, Matt, I wonder if you actually, uh, another Matt, um, this question in the chat, um, how big would you recommend a board to be versus size of overall budget? Do you have some thoughts there? So, um, are you asking at what point do you need a board? You might start Is there, that, but yeah, I think part of that, but you know how, you know, if we only have a $28,000 budget, do we need 12 people or do we, you know, can you talk a little uh, bit about budget versus size sure. maybe a bit? Sure. So there's sort of two schools of thought there. One is that you have a larger board, doesn't matter how big a budget is, you have a larger board so as to be able to help you do what needs to be done. And the other school of thought is you have a small board, which is a constellation of stars. So you have a more of a short, a smaller powerhouse board. And uh, it's part of that is what your preferred style of working is. Boards require a fair bit of nurturing. And so be careful about a too big a board. I, I know like the Lincoln Center in uh, New York, it's a massive budget, isn't it? But they got 75 board members. It's a $100,000 expectation annual gift from each board member and a seven-figure gift within four years. So, I mean, people are lined up to be a part of that board. But can you imagine the amount of attention that that, that would require? Um, I have a friend who runs an organization with a board of 50. Oh, my God. My board is like 21. That requires a lot of work. Uh, ben, we were at, what, eight with Spire? Yeah. And um, so I think you know, bigger boards require a whole lot more work, but you may be able to, as a result, um, generate a greater impact, but they're going to require quite a bit of work. Now, some board members may be the ones who do that work for you in terms of the feeding and nurturing of the board members versus a smaller board, even you know four or five, especially in the earlier days where it's a constellation of workers depending upon what you want. So I, I, I think you've, you need to calibrate it according to the maturity of the organization of what you want them to do. Um, you know, my, my experience of boards 12 to 15, if they're active is a terrific size in my, in the ways in which I work 
it's been a very helpful size to be able to do the different sorts of functions that boards need to be doing. That's great, very helpful. Okay, did we have any other questions that we have just a few minutes uh, to honor everybody's time? Maybe if we get in one or two quick ones more, if somebody just has a burning thing that they wanted to ask tonight. All right, well, I think seeing none so far, just want to double check in the chat. Yeah, ben, when you're, when, when you're ready to close, let me share our ending story. Okay, great. Well, yeah, okay. I, think, I think we're at that point. So let you close us out. All right. Well, thank you. Let me tell you, uh, my father, I'm Australian. My father is British. He, he immigrated to Australia after World War II. And I immigrated to the United States 20 years ago. So we're a family of immigrants. Um, he tells, he, he wrote to me, I asked him to write about some of his experience in World War II. He wrote to me and told me this story. And he's told, we've talked about it since died. He tells the story of being in a German village just after the war. And, and he was in a tanker. So he's in tanks. So he is driving into this bombed out village and he stops and he gets out and there's Edwin is one of his tank mates and Edwin's a British guy and he uh, is a, he would be a concert pianist if he weren't in the tanks with my dad, Fred. My father tells the story of coming into this uh, German village, going to a bombed out uh, public building and in there finding this piano, which has, uh, you know, the rafters have collapsed all around it and so forth. And dad says, we went in and we pulled the rafters and such off of the uh, piano and Edwin opens up the, uh, the piano and it's in good condition on the inside, the keys look great. And he said, Edwin sits down and he plays the Warsaw Concerto. A and it strikes me that in amongst all this devastation, this extraordinary moment of beauty arose. And I want for us to not be disheartened by this very difficult period that we're in, you know, whether that be in your own family circumstance or professionally, the impact has been devastating for many of you. I'm encouraged by Fred's experience that in amongst this, this awfulness. In fact, we can at moments clear away the, the debris and still make beautiful music. I, I think it, it, it calls us to believe that that is yet to happen. So I would encourage you to not be disheartened, but to believe that in fact, um, that can be your experience. We are all Edwin. I love that, such a, a beautiful, moving story. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And thank you everyone uh, for being here. We appreciate uh, spending um, these last 90 minutes with us. I hope um, that this was helpful and we hope to see you uh, for our next lecture and stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again.